Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, my name is Samir Nuhayri. I'm a consultant uh, rheumatologist. Uh, I would like first uh, to thank Dr. Wiam Hussain for the invitation. I've been enjoying those two days. I'm actually also an internist, so it gave me a chance to review some of my uh, endocrine. Uh, the objectives of my talk would be to discuss the most relevant endocrine-associated rheumatic disorders. Hopefully, I'll go over the pathology, diagnosis, and you know the management, which is important. And then we'll have some questions for you, and uh, hopefully I'll have some time to discuss the importance of how rheumatology and endocrinology, how we can overlap for the benefit of the patient. Uh, Sir William Osler, you know, the, the father of modern medicine, uh, you know, he has a saying when, where he said, when a patient with arthritis walks in the front door, I feel like leaving out the back door. And that was, you know, in the 1800s. And the reason for this statement is that they, they had nothing, actually. You know, aspirin came in the, uh, like in the 1890s. So, and uh, Felix Hoffman, you know, invented this aspirin to treat his dad's rheumatism. So basically now it's a whole different era that we're living in. We have the biologicals, we have, you know, lots of stuff. So alhamdulillah, you know, we have better management uh, than before. Again, we're a subspecialty of internal medicine. We deal more with rheumatological diseases, musculoskeletal diseases. Uh, the, our diseases used to be called collagen vascular diseases. Now the term is connective tissue. And we're basically dealing with like more than 100 diseases. Uh, I'm sure you also, you know, we overlap with endocrinology and some of the autoimmune diseases. Uh, so basically, when I move to this part of the world, there is, you know, always this misconception about what is rheumatism, you know, is it like cancer, do they overlap? So a simple way, you know, just to put it out there is that, you know, we have our immunity, you know, if the immune system is lazy, and I'll tell you a fact now, but please don't be scared, every one of us, you know, during this one second has hundreds, thousands of cancer cells in our body. But alhamdulillah, they're being cleared by the immune system. Rheumatism is the opposite. So the immune system is not sluggish. It's not lazy. What's happening is that the immune system is being more, you know, it's fighting, you know, the, the body. So that's what's happening. Uh, those are our major categories of the diseases that we deal with that I just wanted to share with you before I go further. So, of course, we have the connective tissue diseases, you know, the lupus, the rheumatoid, you know, the seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Then we have a certain category of diseases where we put the endocrine stuff, like with the metabolic, the hematological, you know, diseases, the gout, the pseudogout, you know, all of this. And then, of course, we deal with vasculitis, we deal with, you know, bone and cartilage disorders, osteoarthritis, we also deal with osteoporosis like you do. And there is kind of a newer, you know, category that we term non-articular and regional musculoskeletal disorders. And this is where, if you've heard of fibromyalgia now, you know, it's, it's in the press, where, where that fits. And, of course, we deal with cancers. Uh, the endocrine diseases that have some overlap with our specialty, the major three are diabetes, you know, thyroid and parathyroid. Of course, Cushing's and acromegaly, but since they were discussed and, uh, you know, for the sake of time, I'll stick to the top three. So in diabetes, we have, you know, categories of rheumatological manifestations that we can summarize. We have the diabetic stiff hand syndrome, you know, also known as prayer's sign. We have Charcot joint or neuropathic arthropathy. Of course, we have the diabetic amyotrophy. Uh, sometimes you can have what is called the diabetic muscle infarction, where the muscle, you know, would infarct. Carpal tunnel, frozen shoulder, trigger fingers. You know, we have DISH or diffuse uh, idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis and the uh, dupetrons. Uh, I'll go over each one briefly again. So the prayer sign, you know, is known as limited joint mobility syndrome. Uh, some authors would refer to it as diabetic chiroarthropathy because it's a type of arthropathy. What happens is there will be contractures uh, and mostly it's flexion contractures in the PIPs and the DIPs of the hands. Sometimes it can move to the wrist also. 
uh, we see the, uh, this with both types of diabetes, and of course, it's you know it has to do with the duration of the disease, whether the diabetes is well controlled or not. So the prayer sign, the the pathology usually it's you know there's a lot of glucose around. What the glucose does is it binds to the collagen, and this collagen is either in the skin or it's the you know periarticular collagen, the one that's around you know the joints. What's happening also is that there is, you know, more hydration of the tissue. And in essence, one and two would lead to less collagen degradation. And that's why these contractures develop. So basically what we ask the patient is we ask them to close, you know, like the gap between the palms. And this should be done, you know, everybody who doesn't have these contractures should be able to close that gap. With the prayer sign, as you can see, the patient is trying but they cannot, there is, there is a gap. Uh, I have the other photo here. Let me see the light. It's not working, I guess. So the one on the left is in a patient with uncontrolled diabetes. You know, The one on the right, uh, interestingly, when they control the diabetes, better glycemic control, the patient did a, a, a bit better. It's the same patient. So for us in rheumatology, you know, I'm sure you remember scleroderma, and I'm sure, you know, we have to always think, you know, is this like the scleroderma? Because, you know, diabetic patients could also develop scleroderma. So we always want to make sure, you know, we don't confuse this. But, you know, in uh, the stiff hand syndrome, the labs, the x-rays, they're all unremarkable. The ANA, the anti-nuclear antibody that, you know, we order a lot, it's usually negative. So that kind of gives us an idea. Uh, the th therapy is actually some physical therapy, control the diabetes better. Uh, unfortunately, you know, they tend to progress. So, but the progression, you know, alhamdulillah, in this case is, it's not gonna limit the function of the hands. So unlike with deforming rheumatoid or other erosive, you know, arthropathies, you won't have that limitation in, in function. Charcot joint, uh, less than 1% of patients, you know, in uh, both types of diabetes, again, seen both in males and females, equal frequency. So again, we're talking about poorly controlled disease, you know, people over 40, long-standing disease, the studies say, you know, more than 10 years. Uh, and it's interesting that usually they, the patients present with painless, you know, it's not like they don't have any pain, it's a swelling and deformity. And the most common joint is the tarsometatarsal joint. I, I have a slide I'll show you, and the ankle. But rarely you can have the knee, the hip, you know, the spine being involved. So that would make it harder, you know, for rheumatologists to kind of do the differential diagnosis. Uh, also, uh, sometimes what can happen is that the patient would present, you know, like an infection, kind of, you know, like a septic arthritis type of way. But please remember that charcoal joint, it's not only diabetes, you know, many things can cause it. Alcohol, syphilis, uh, you know, uh, leprosy, patients on dialysis, they can develop this. So that's the, uh, you know, I wanted you to just to be oriented, if you can recall, I know you're not rheumatologists, you know, but the tarsal bones, you have the calcaneus, the talus, and the navicular, you know, and the cuboid. But then you have the cuneiforms, the medial, lateral, uh, uh, cuneiforms and the intermediate one, uh, those will make, let me see, this, this is not working actually, sorry, can I have some help here? I just wanted to point to the, maybe I can use the mouse, oh. because I want you to know this because it's important for another slide that's coming up. I want to be sure that, you know, both of us are on the same page. So the tarsal bones, the ones I named, they make a junction with the metatarsals. That's called Lisfranc joint. So that, that's where usually it's going to do it. And what happens is that as th this progresses, we would have what is called a mid-tarsal collapse. And that would cause, I don't know if you've heard of the term, uh, the rocker uh, bottom feet because you know you've had that collapse and then a lot of times you can see ulcers due to the neuropathy the x-rays if you guys remember you know there are the five famous d's there will be 
dislocation, destruction, debris, you know, disorganization in the bones, as you can see there. Uh, now, remember, uh, this is increased density, okay, because when you talk about like the osteoporosis or the septic arthritis, it's, it's the opposite. So that helps us. And also the, the margins usually, you know, they, they would have some debris. Uh, again, it's repetitive microtrauma to a desensate, you know, foot, a foot that, you know, neurologically is not that active. So what this leads to is, you know, increased blood flow, hyperemia, and then you get what is called an osteoclastic resorption of the bone. So that's why you have that, uh, you know, brown tumor, if you recall, you know, that's the hemosiderin. Uh, that, that's why they call it the brown tumors. Uh, the treatment is basically, you know, uh, protected weight bearing, uh, sometimes, you know, soft casts, make sure they, you know, wear good shoes. Uh, we have to, you know, deal with the ulcers. But unfortunately, there is no role for orthopedic surgeons to come in and do like, you know, an arthroplasty or a fusion because there is nothing to fuse to. You know, the joint is, is destroyed. Uh, amputation. So that's, that's what we're faced with. Diabetic osteolysis, that's why I wanted to, you know, point to the metatarsal bones. So this is what happens here is there is osteoporosis and like variable degrees of resorption. And we're talking about the distal metatarsals, the ones close to the phalanges. And again, it's in the feet. And again, this can be painful or painless. It can happen, you know, anytime during the course of the disease. We don't know why it happens actually. So in, from our point, we want to make sure it's not osteomyelitis. Uh, again, it's conservative uh, therapy, but interestingly, this m may resolve completely and, you know, people, you know, get better. Uh, the x-rays, they would show what we call a licked uh, candy appearance. You know, if you see that fifth metatarsal there, you know, when they lick a stick of candy, so that, that's the fifth metatarsal. Diabetic amyotrophy, interesting because we deal with uh, the inflammatory myopathies. You know, if you remember, we deal with polymyositis, dermatomyositis, which are inflammatory my you know, myopathies. So sometimes diabetes can present similarly. And usually in diabetes, though, it's the pelvis, you know, girdle. It's less likely in the, sh uh, in the shoulder girdle. Uh, but at times, you know, you can have 50%, you know, bilateral involvement. So that kind of confuses it with our diseases, you know, is it inflammatory myopathies? And a lot of times due to the muscle wasting and the weakness, you know, the patient would have like, it would affect their gait, they would lose weight, and, you know, they would have like anorexia. So what, uh, here we're talking again about, you know, middle-aged, you know, people, uh, more in males, but it's in like well-controlled, you know, diabetics. So we're not talking like with the Charcot or the other, you know, stuff. This is a patient who's taking, you know, good control of their diabetes. But it's a diabetes of long duration. So uh, no evidence, again, of retinopathy or nephropathy. They might have like a distal, you know, uh, neuropathy in the feet. Uh, the labs would be normal. Again, uh, sometimes we do like nerve conduction studies. It wouldn't show any changes in the muscle, it would show changes, you know, in the nerves. Uh, if we end up doing a muscle biopsy, because that's important to us, you know, to see whether this is polymyositis, dermatomyositis, or different types of inflammatory myopathies, most of the time, diabetic amyotrophy would show just muscle atrophy, but no inflammation. So it's not considered like an inflammatory myopathy per se. Uh, again, the cause is not clear. We're not sure. It could be due to a vasculitis, you know, affecting uh, the nerves, but we really don't know. 50% uh, of the patients, you know, it takes them some time. The same thing with the inflammatory myopathies that we deal with. Usually it takes us time to treat the patient. We're using corticosteroids, you know, most of the time. But, you know, when you, you know, diabetes, you have to be careful. So a lot of times, you know, we're doing also immunosuppressant therapy, like, you know, azathioprine, you know, all the drugs that we use. Uh, muscle infarction, interestingly, it can happen spontaneously. We don't know why. And the patients usually would have acute onset of pain and swelling. It would be for like days, you know, most of the time it's the thigh or the calf. Again, it's in long-standing insulin-dependent diabetics. 
but you know these patients usually have other mi microvascular complications. Uh, the CK could be high. Uh, labs otherwise are unremarkable. Most of the time we have to do an MRI. We do that because we want to rule out any infection, any abscess, you know, make sure it's not cancer. And a lot of times, you know, we might need, you know, a biopsy. So that's question one for you guys. What radiologic changes are associated with Charcot joint? Is it a licked candy stick appearance? Who would go for that? Okay, is it calcification and ossification of the anterior longitudinal ligament of four vertebrae or four contiguous vertebrae? Who would go for that? Or is it number three, the five Ds, destruction, you know? So basically, it's the five Ds. So the licked candy was the diabetic osteolysis, you know, the one with the distal metatarsal. I know it's the end of the day, it's the last, uh, no, Dr. Hussein Saadi is after me, so he'll have the last lecture in the day. But I'll tell you about the four contiguous univertebrae. You know, so I'll talk a little bit about the frozen shoulder. I see a lot of these patients, believe me, they're more common than you think. You know, you know in rheumatology, we have it whenever a diabetic patient is complaining of shoulder pain, it's probably you know, an adhesive capsulitis. And it's like up to a third of patients. It's much more common in diabetics than non-diabetics. Uh, five times more common. And the typical patient here is a female. You know, she has type 2 diabetes, long duration. She would have stiffness, a decrease in the range of motion of the uh, joint. Uh, again, 50% are going to have, you know, bilateral involvement. Uh, and usually it's the non-dominant non shoulder. So maybe it's because they use it, you know, less. So it tends to form, you know, more calcification in that joint. Labs are okay. X-rays sometimes do show the calcifications. And most of the time we have to do corticosteroid injections. So we tell the patient, you know, you either want to end up having an arthroscopy or we'll, we'll give you an injection. You know, it helps to, you know, dissolve that calcium. DISH. So DISH is diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, used to be known as uh, Forestier's disease or ankylosing hyperostosis, although this term ankylosing, you know, because we use ankylosing spondylitis, which is different, you know, from DISH. So this happens in uh, like up to a fifth of type 2 diabetics. Most of the time, these are patients who are obese, you know, they're also uh, middle-aged. Uh, the patients usually present with the stiffness. It's not as the pain, you know, it's more like stiffness. There is a decrease in the range of motion because of that calcification, you know, in this ligament. So it limits them. But it's not as much pain. And when you do an x-ray, you know, and the disc spaces, that's why I was saying, you know, ankylosing spondylitis is a totally different, you know, game. The disc spaces, remember, I don't know if you guys remember, we call them epiphyseal joints or facet joints. You know, those are the ones that are being injected by ortho or neurosurgeons. You know, like first thing, if you have back pain. So even the sacroiliac joints, everything is normal in them. So it's only that calcification of that ligament. And the ligament, you know, spans four different vertebrae. Uh, NSAIDs, you know, physical therapy we do. So that's what I was referring to, contiguous, meaning they have to be next to each other. And, you know, just orient yourself, you know, the anterior part is where the white arrows are. Can you appreciate, you know, some of the calcification there? We can even see it in the elderly, you know, sometimes. And some studies say like up to 12% of the elderly who don't have diabetes can have DISH. Carpal tunnel, I'm sure you've heard the mnemonic, pragmatic, you know, pregnancy, rheumatoid, acromegaly, and diabetes, mechanical, you know, those who type a lot, amyloidosis can do it, thyroid disease, infections, and of course, you know, the gout and the pseudogout. Uh, we see carpal tunnel again in up to a fifth of uh, diabetics. Uh, numbness in the median, you know, nerve distribution, so it's you know, the thumb and the second and the third digits and half of the fourth, you would see the numbness. Uh, most of the time it's worse at night, so that's why we tell the patients to wear, you know, like splints, especially at night, because what happens is when you sleep at night, you're going to bend, you know, that's how most people sleep. So the splints help, you know, the palms be straight. If you recall Tenel's and Phelan's sign, you know, when you tap the median nerve or you have them do this just for 30 seconds, 
and then they will have you know the numbness. Uh, sometimes we do order for EMG nerve conduction studies. If you see thinner atrophy, which is you know this part under the thumb, that means it's like you know in, in later stage. Uh, again, it's a neuropathy due to an extrinsic, uh, extrinsic compression. Sorry, but it could be also a microvascular disease. That is, you know, the blood vessels that supply the nerves. You know, again, there is a complication there. Uh, I, I already told you, you know, we do splints and sets. Uh, steroid injections are very good. If you have any of these patients, I mean, they do very well after the steroid injections. The last thing we do is surgery. We refer to a surgeon. They do a decompression. Uh, trigger fingers, you know, I'm sure you've seen many of your patients. So these are the fingers that lock. You know, the patient tell you, oh, doc, you know, my finger is locking. And then they would have to do it this way. So this is because of the, it's called flexor tenosynovitis. Uh, again, you know, anywhere from 5% to a third of diabetic patients, females again, uh, you know, they, they will have the pain in the, in the digits. And that's why they come to us a lot of times thinking, is this rheumatoid? Is it an inflammatory arthropathy? Their symptoms are worse in the morning. So that's why the primary care physicians would refer them to us. Because if you recall, you know, symptoms in the morning, think autoimmune. So a lot of them come to us, you know, just to, to rule out that. It's, it's not a, an inflammatory arthropathy. Uh, what happens is, you know, they, they will have a nodule at the, uh, I will show you the, the pulley here. If you can appreciate, you know, it's, it's like uh, a over the tendon that covers it, a sheath, and the nodule gets inflamed. So that's, that's what happens. And when we inject, actually, injections work very well for this. The, it helps a lot. The last thing, you know, we do is surgery. Uh, Dupatrons, it's a different type of thing. Again, you know, some studies say, 60% of type 1 diabetics, which I find to be, wow, you know, 60%, that's a lot. Because we don't, you know, we see those patients, but not as much, you know. So that's why I question that 60%, to be honest with you. So what's happening here is thickening of the palmar fascia. And usually it's the fourth and the fifth fingers where it happens. Now, Dupitrons, we see it in, you know, like people of Scandinavian descent. Again, people who do mechanical stuff. Alcoholics, we, we see that. Uh, it doesn't have to do with like whether you control the diabetes or not. The last studies say that vitamin E, you know, we give vitamin E to the patient, you know, for like longer time and, you know, it helps. Again, you know, it's like microvascular ischemia that's happening to those myofibroblasts. That's a dupatrons. Uh, so we move to the time. Yeah. So we'll move to the uh, thyroid. First, we'll do hypothyroid, and the mnemonic here is TRAP. You know, you see in hypothyroidism, you you know, you see carpal tunnel, 15% of these patients. Raynaud's, you know, when the digits, they turn kind of blue, you know, in cold weather, younger females, due to the vasoconstriction, you know, in the digits. Aching muscles, so we're back to the inflammatory myopathies. You know, in thyroid disease, they really mimic the inflammatory myopathies. So we've seen a lot of like misdiagnosis here. That's why, you know, whoever comes to us, we're doing a TSH, like, you know, for everybody. And then uh, you see the proximal, you know, muscle weakness and uh, uh, stiffness, you know, the elevated CK, like uh, I was saying. Uh, so in severe hypothyroidism, mixed edematous arthropathy, you know, there is this type of arthropathy that we have, and usually uh, it's affecting the large joints, so like the knees. Uh, the patients usually, they would have swelling, they would have stiffness. It's interesting, though, that when you tap, you know, the joint, when you get the, you know, synovial fluid out, it's not inflammatory at all. But there is an interesting, you know, sign that, you know, it's on our boards, I'm, I'm sure it's on the internal medicine boards, that this fluid, when you tap it, there is something we call a string sign. So usually, you know, the synovial fluid, because of all the proteins inside, the mucin, you know, it gives you like a one to two inches, you know, lengthy. In this case, it's like one to two feet. You know, imagine what kind of fluid. X-rays would be normal, you know, but this, there will be synovial, you know, uh, membrane thickening in the joint, no question. But the fluid is not inflammatory. 
And that's what, what I mean to tell you, you know, when we tap the fluid, you just do this test right away. Imagine, you know, you're doing this and the fluid is still you know, coming down. So that's one of, one of the signs of uh, hypo, you know, severe hypothyroidism. Uh, Hashimoto's disease, we see a lot of it in clinic, and the reason they come to us is because of a positive ANA. So the positive ANA in Hashimoto's, most of the time, it doesn't mean that they have a connective tissue disease. Just for your own information, because, you know, I get a lot of referrals about a positive ANA. Studies have shown up to 15%, one five, 15% of a positive ANA is not significant. Meaning that if we get 100 people, you know, from the street, perfectly normal, 100 people, 15 of them will have an, a positive ANA test. It doesn't mean that they have lupus. It doesn't mean that they have a connective tissue disease. It's just, you know, their body is making some antibodies. So we see a lot of these, you know, patients, and of course, they've done some genetic testing on them. Uh, to show that those with Hashimoto's are more prone to have other autoimmune diseases. And that is true, you know, we, we also see it. Hyperthyroidism, so in this case, we're seeing the thyroid acropatchy. We also see the proximal muscle weakness, similar to the one, you know, to the inflammatory myopathies that I told you about. Uh, and we also see, you know, frozen shoulder with hyperthyroidism sometimes. And of course, osteoporosis that was addressed by the previous uh, speaker. So thyroid acropatchy, it's very rare. You know, it's, they would say it complicates like 1% of those who have graves. I don't know if your experience is the same. So what happens is there will be soft tissue swelling and it's the hands, they would have clubbing and peri uh, periostitis. So they will have increased, you know, ostitis, uh, especially in the metacarpal and the phalangeal joints. Now, the pain varies. Sometimes you can see, you know, a lot of soft tissue swelling, a lot of changes, but the patient is not in pain. Uh, strongly associated with the ophthalmopathy and the pretibial mixed edema. No effective therapy, unfortunately. And see what I mean when I say, you know, the periostitis and the metacarpal uh, joints, it can happen in the phalanges. Uh, so my second question to you is... What condition is the string sign, which is increased viscosity of the synovial fluid, as we have discussed, so what condition is this seen in? Is it A, thyroid acropatchy? Is it B, severe hypothyroid mixed edematous arthropathy? Is it carpal tunnel? Is it agromegaly? Is it frozen or adhesive capsulitis of the shoulder? Do you guys want to vote? Hmm? B, excellent. And that's how we look at it a lot of times to differentiate from the inflammatory, you know, arthropathies. We look at the CK. So the CK, you know, of course, would be increased. And polymyositis, dermatomyositis, it's going to be increased, no question. In hypothyroidism, yes. But in hyperthyroidism, it's going to be normal, the CK. And then, of course, you know, it's more like proximal muscle weakness, you know. When you do the biopsy, Inflammation is only seen in our diseases, in the polymyositis, the dermatomyositis, not in your diseases. In your diseases, the biopsy is normal. Some medications, you know, that have been shown to be associated with rheumatic syndromes, and it's the ones that you guys use, you know, PTU, uh, propylthiouracil, and methimazole, and it's basically lupus-like syndromes and vasculitis. So... We've seen these cases, you know, in the past. Primary hyperparathyroidism. So here we see proximal muscle weakness again, and the enzymes are going to be normal. This is hyperparathyroidism. Uh, there will be chondrocalcinosis, you know, with pseudogout. So that's why when we're investigating, you know, patients for pseudogout, so usually we send for a PTH all the time. Uh, osteoporosis is also there. Uh, there is what is called osteogenic synovitis. Sometimes it's like a bony collapse of uh, like a thin bone. Uh, tendon ruptures and ectopic soft tissue calcifications. Because remember, it's hyperparathyroidism. So the time is up, not even one minute.
No. Is it 30 minutes already? Okay. Just let me finish then. Three minutes? Yeah. So I'll end with I'll end with this slide, you know, which is the brown tumors, also known as osteitis fibrosa cystica, and that's you know in prolonged hyperparathyroidism, and usually it's it's the hands, and what happens is there is resorption, you know, of the bones. Sometimes you can see this, uh, see the resorption, and sometimes you can see it in uh, the spine, uh, the rugged jersey spine, because you know it kind of looks like a rugged uh, jersey. But uh, I'll skip over that. I was going to tell you a bit about, you know, our, how we can work together, but I guess that's fine. I, I'll end, uh, uh, these are my references with, I know that we're busy doctors, you know, we have to take care of patients all the time, you know, we have to attend these conferences. But remember, it's the patient at the end of the day. And believe me, all the time I hear complaints from patients. You know, they're not spending time with us. They're mostly into the computers. So... I mean, our prophet, our beloved prophet, peace be upon him, he says this, you know, show mercy to those on earth, you know, God will show mercy to you. So I, I, I just a reminder to myself and to you guys. Thank you.